I am here today with Kyle Spears. We are at Carolyn Brewing, and uh, this is a, just an amazing facility, and it's got this uh, wonderful connection that we really need to understand the differences between modern brewing and modern brewing equipment and what's going on in the 18th and the 19th century and the massive challenges uh, that, there are, that there is with this kind of equipment and how it's done. Not very many places in the United States do it like this. Are there any other places? Not with the caveat that everything that we produce on site here and ferment in these American white oak wooden barrels uh, is sold to the public. So right. we're licensed to be able to sell it to the public. So there are a few facilities in other museums around the country that are doing similar brewing demonstrations, but their final product never gets to be tasted by the general public or sold. So that's a, that's a, a real special thing that's happening here that isn't happening anyplace else. Um, so uh, this, this, we were having a discussion earlier and this particular uh, brew, this uh, particular beer today was one that I thought was um, really kind of teased out the issues that you're having here. So what's, what's the beer that's uh, being brewed today? Yeah, so we're brewing this Berliner Weisse style beer. So this, this Weisse beer, German wheat beer, but brewed specifically in, in Berlin um, around the mid 19th century. And it's this beer that's really, really uh, not unique to that time period, but different than what a modern beer drinker would be generally used to for a long time in America because Yes, it's a German wheat beer, but it's a German wheat beer that's specifically made sour by lactobacillus bacteria. So um, one of the common kind of spoiling agents for beer up until modern uh, stainless steel tanks for brewing um, and metal containers for storing uh, beer and cold refrigeration for beer, uh, you would have had this heavy influence from things like wild yeast strains, but also uh, lactobacillus bacteria, which is the same bacteria that creates uh, sourness and sourdough bread. Um, it turns milk into things like yogurt or kefir. Um, so it, it creates sauerkraut and pickles. Um, all of these kind of lacto fermented foods have this distinct sourness. And that's because when that particular bacteria eats sugar, it creates lactic acid. Um, whereas yeast, which is what you really want to create most beer styles um, to provide flavor, but also alcohol, um, when yeast eats sugar, it creates alcohol. Um, when this bacteria strain eats sugar, it creates sourness. Um, so this is this like really, really tart beer that um, was prized in Berlin and in Northern Germany in particular uh, because of its effervescence and because of its light color, um, but also because of this kind of lactic tartness that it had. So it was this refreshing drink for the summertime and um, eventually became the kind of preferred beer of Napoleon's troops uh, even as well at that time period. So. so this strain of beer that's being done today uh, does it have, you're not pitching a normal packaged yeast or any, anything into that, right? So we are, we are adding the yeast to it, yeast that we know will give us a predictable alcohol product. Um, so alcohol production is still key. We're trying to make this beer that, unlike a lot of other beer styles, even commercially at that time, which are maybe four to 7% alcohol, this Berliner, one of the other traits, aside from its clarity, its effervescence and its sour, flavor um, is also noted for its low alcohol content. So it's this really refreshing beer that can be consumed in the summertime, but you still need yeast, uh, a controlled yeast pitch in order to create that alcohol. Um, but it also has this natural lactic uh, fermentation that's going on once the yeast is done creating alcohol, this bacteria kind of creeps in and starts to create this sour acid um, characteristic that it's almost like uh, like an unsweetened lemonade in the final product so yes we do add yeast to it but we're allowing it some more time in the wood so that the lactic bacteria that's actually soaked into the wooden staves of that barrel have time to come out once the yeast is done consuming the sugar that it wants and it will come in and consume sugars to create sourness for us Right, so this same barrel has been used multiple times for exactly this same beer so that it kind of brings that flavor all along with it, right? Yeah, exactly. So like I, I noted earlier, this, this wood and the reason why you do not see wooden barrels for primary fermentation in a modern beer or brewing setup um, is for the sole reason that wood is very porous. So that porous wood will soak up um, the liquid that's in here. It soaks up any sugars that are in that liquid that were or are in there typically for a more kind of uh, even fermentation when you don't want sourness, um, all of that stuff will get soaked into the wood and the, that lactic bacteria will actually live off of the whatever soaked into the wood itself. 
if you even if you don't have any liquid in this barrel um, there's enough sugar inherently inside of the wood itself and the staves that that bacteria will kind of go a little bit dormant but maintain and, and kind of live off of that for a period of time to the point that if we add a fresh new batch of wort or sugar water into that barrel even if we haven't added anything else to it it will come out of literally out of the woodwork and start to kind of consume those remaining sugars and, and create sourness again so it's this kind of everlasting barrel that every time we put something into it it's going to come out tasting sour so we we typically will add our berliner wort to that to make that specific berliner style but say we had a porter wort that we brewed, a really dark wort with roasted grains. If we added that porter wort to this barrel, it would also come out tasting sour. So all of a sudden we would have a sour porter, um, which is a reality for most beer makers up until more modern materials come into play for commercial beer brewing uh, is this ever present danger of having some type of sourness in your beer because of these porous wooden barrels that were being used. So the question is, in the 18th century, in the 19th century, you know, you say an ever-present danger, but maybe it's a desired flavor. Maybe everyone's used to that, and so it's just the normal thing. Yeah, exactly. So we always have to kind of remove ourselves from our modern perception of what beer should taste like, which has evolved over time, and put ourselves in, in that time period with the reality of the materials that are being used, and in our case, it's wooden barrels. You always would have had some type of sourness in your beer. Um, and it was up to the brewer or up to the pub owner um, when that beer was being served and how long it remained in that barrel at what temperature it was being stored at. Um, it was kind of up to them to decide how sour that beer was when you were consuming it. And there were ways to do it by the 1850s um, and even package the beer so that it wouldn't be sour at all when you consumed it. And that's the majority of the beer that we serve on site here at Carillon Brewing Company. It all gets fermented in wood. Um, but if you, if you do want that beer style and certain beer styles kind of persist throughout time specifically to maintain that sour flavor profile, Berliner Weisse being one of those. And Berliner from, commercial, from a commercial brewing standpoint, kind of disappeared for a long time. There's only a couple breweries in Germany right now, commercially, that are brewing Berliner Weisse for the, the masses. And it has kind of evolved into this heavily sweetened version of Berliner Weisse as well to help mitigate the sourness because even Germans have kind of, that, that sour flavor profile fell out of fashion for them. Um, so now it's a, it's a children's beer in Germany. It's this low alcohol beer with a very heavily sweetened syrup added to it, either in a, the form of a raspberry flavor or a sweet Woodruff herbal flavor. Um, but they call it Kinder beer in Germany because it's a children's beer typically. It tastes more like soda. Um, but American craft beer, kind of as, as we've been, these American craft brewers, these even modern ones have been digging into the historic record and finding these old styles. In America, we kind of like everything ex extreme and we're, we like that base flavor sour profile in certain beers. And Berliner happens to be a truly historic beer that also is catering to the modern American craft sour beer makers palate um, and beer drinkers palate. So if you want a sour beer, you can still have a historic beer, but it's, uh, it's still trending today um, in America with this really heavy sour flavor profile. So as a challenge here, how do you keep everything from turning into sour beer? It's a good question. It's been a big struggle. We've been brewing on this system with these barrels, uh, with some version of this fermentation system for about seven years now. Um, and we had a point where all of our beers in this facility came out sour. So one by one, and this was the first barrel to kind of start all of that. Um, this barrel went sour on us, and then it was kind of a domino effect, one barrel after another. Um, started to go sour and those these these microbes like wild yeast strains and bacteria strains kind of pop from one barrel to the next when you're brewing on shared equipment it, again it's this ever-present danger that you're gonna kind of cross contaminate things um, but for us we just have to be that much more diligent if we do not want to make a sour beer and we're always running scalding water through things where we do have the advantage in this facility even though we're replicating historic beer we have a, some modern chemicals that we can use that won't damage the wooden uh, barrels or the copper tubing that we're using and the copper kettles that we're using to brew with um, and we can kind of help mitigate that sourness so we now have four barrels that don't have as much of um, if any of that those souring microbes that this barrel do does have in them and we only uh, we try to keep those other four barrels separate from this barrel 
Um, so it's just trying to pay attention to it. And if we're brewing a batch of porter, we know not to put it in this barrel if we don't want that porter to come out sour. So, so this building, this barrel makes a particular flavor beer. Uh, I, I think that's really an interesting concept, that idea that um, in the 18th century, in the 19th century, there's all these small breweries and they make beer and each one of them has their own flavor thing that's happening because of where it's made. Right. Yeah, so you have, you have essentially proprietary yeast strain. So we're all like up until the 1850s, until lager beer, lager yeast gets discovered and lager beer kind of takes over in America in particular in terms of commercial beer production. Ale yeast is very, very expressive, and ale yeast strains have a lot of different flavors associated with them. Um, so you're exactly right. It, this building is made of wood. A lot of these microbes, if they don't have direct sugar to munch on, they're living on some stuff um, and materials that are hospitable for them until they can find a good food source um, to really do their thing. And so they're just kind of laying in wait. So this building is completely wooden on the inside. Um, we know that we have wild yeast strains in here and bacteria strains that are always in this environment and that translates directly to the flavor of the beer that we brew here and it would have been the same for every other brewery in town so every brewery in town may brew a porter which is this kind of wildly popular commercial beer by the 1850s um, but every brewery's porter would taste a little bit different based on the building that they're in based on the the orchards or the trees that are around the brewery itself. If they have the windows open at certain times of the year, wild yeast strains and bacteria strains will come in. Travelers, people coming from outside of the area where that brewery is located are bringing microflora with them that will inevitably make their way into the beer. We bake bread in this facility with sourdough lactobacillus bacteria strains. Um, inevitably, some of that influences our beers that we brew here, even the kind of not very noticeably sour beers that we brew. Um, we'll have those things in there. And as a, as a beer brewer, we can be conscious of, um, even if those microbes are in the beers that we don't want to taste sour, we're doing things to ensure that nobody ever tastes that sourness or we never allow that beer to get to the point where it tastes sour. So those souring microbes might be in that liquid, but if we can get it out of the wood and into a metal keg and into a refrigerator, then those microbes are not as active. So we can kind of mitigate it and we can kind of keep those dormant so that when the customer tastes it, they're not tasting sourness. Um, or if we want a sour beer, then we're going full in and letting it sit in here for three months until it develops the proper sourness. Right, I, I think it's incredible that you know you're able to experiment with these historical things, right? So that you can you can try brewing in that in that period fashion and find out what the challenges really are, what the beer could have been really like. It's an, a wonderful uh, thing. So thank you so much, yeah. uh, and the time here is just wonderful. If you ever get a chance to come to Dayton, Ohio, uh, check out the Carolyn Brewery here, it is, it is a great experience. So thank you so much, Kyle. Thanks for being here.